Well, hi, welcome to my latest video. Well, on this one, I'm going to continue the new series I've started on creating a new content creation PC, sort of like a super editing workstation. What I'm going to cover this time is details about the motherboard that I bought from ASUS, the ASUS ProArt Z790 Creator with Wi-Fi. But it also has a lot of other features besides that. So, you know, they could have gone on and on listing them, as I said before. But I'm going to open this box up. We'll take a look at some of the features that I will directly use and some of the main reasons that I bought it. And then we'll also talk about some of the other things that it comes with that other people may find useful for their purposes, whether or not they're into content creating. This could become a good gaming motherboard as well. It doesn't have a lot of power stages to it, so it might have a little bit of limitation on that part of it. But other than that, I mean, unbelievable in terms of the amount of connectivity and storage and other features that this particular motherboard provides. So I'll open it up, we'll see what it comes with, and uh, go over all these features. And if you stick around to the end, you'll see how I go through some of the things you have to be aware of in installing this in your PC. Okay, let's get started. Okay, let's start the real panel, which is where some of the main significant features are that made me pick this motherboard. First of all, I'll start with the most important thing. This guy has 10 gig Ethernet built onto the motherboard right here. A regular RJ45 connector, and that is probably the number one feature I was looking for. You also have a 2.5 gig interface as well, and I'll show you in a few minutes exactly how those can be used simultaneously. Also, it has six USB 3.2 connectors. They are really the Gen 1, so they can go up to 5 gig, but that's good enough. Also, it has Wi-Fi. And I'll show you the Wi-Fi in 10 a little while. It also has the BIOS flashback using this particular USB connector here and then pressing this button with the proper for file loaded on the USB that you plugged into there, it can load up without even having a CPU present on the motherboard. Now that's a big advantage because you wouldn't have to boot it up if for some reason the BIOS got corrupted. You could overwrite it with the correct one or a better one without any issue. It also has 7.1 audio. Now on the back panel here, it's not quite as featured as what the front panel is that I'll mention later on in the video. In addition to all of that, it has an HDMI port. So if you have an integrated graphics adapter onto your CPU, which the vast majority of Intel CPUs would have, then you can actually connect a monitor to this without having a GPU on, without having a separate graphics processing unit or graphics card connected to it. That's a great thing for troubleshooting, if nothing else, but it also helps with some of the editing software because it can use that onboard graphics processor to help with the rendering and other features of the editor. In addition to that, which is a feature I probably won't use initially, but in the long term I may, it has Thunderbolt 2 built into the motherboard and it has two separate devices created. These two USB 2s are what the output of the Thunderbolt would be, but it's very specific. It's meant for the Thunderbolt 2 where you are inputting graphics information into these two input DisplayPort connectors, and then that gets converted through Thunderbolt 2 out through the USB 2.0 connectors, and they match up. Here is number one, in number one, and there is the matching out number one, the same thing for in number two and a matching out number two. Now, you'll see later on, this actually comes with a cable about two foot long that will allow you to plug into the input port here over to an output port from your graphics card, an external graphics card plugged into one of the PCIe adapters. So that's a great feature. So those are the key things that I wanted to point out on the back panel here, and they are quite significant, and they're some of the main reasons that I picked this motherboard. Okay, let's take a look at the main section of the motherboard now. The right-hand side here is what would normally be at the top of most cases. First thing I'll mention is you see this hole over here? Well, that's where a screw would go to connect the motherboard, the ninth screw, into the case itself. Now that's a dust catcher on some cases, depending on whether it's lying flat like this or vertical or it's open air. That's why they give you this little plug that comes with 
the motherboard, a rubber plug that you can put in here and close that up, up if you'd like to, to prevent the dust accumulation inside of that hole. So let's start with the CPU. The socket, LGA1700, will support 12th gen, 13th gen, and 14th gen CPUs, standard LGA1700. There are 16 plus one dual power stages on this motherboard. Now that's not the highest that you could get, obviously, for some of the high-end gaming motherboards, but it's pretty good and probably would work for 95 to 98% of the applications out there, other than extreme gaming, for example. It probably would need many more stages than that. If you look here, we have three PCI slots. They're both the size of times 16 in terms of data paths. However, they don't all are capable of that. For example, this one by itself, if you put a graphic card, for example, in here, it will support times 16 data path. Now, most graphic cards don't really need that, but maybe in the future you might. This second slot here splits the 16 bits with that one, however. So if you put another device here, if it senses one, it will do a times eight across both of them. So this will be times eight and that'll be times eight. And again, that'll work with most cases of putting two graphics cards because most of the ones, I think there's probably maybe only one exception I know of where it actually could use the times 16 to improve the performance of the graphics capability. But that's a rarity. This particular PCI slot here, well, that's interesting because even though it's the size of a times 16 in terms of data paths, it really only has four of those data paths wired. So it's really a times four. Most high-end peripherals will work within times four, whether it's a capture card or some other sort of uh, digital to analog converter or other devices like that, even in the terms of uh, getting something like, uh, you know, a logic design board, you know, from Intel or another provider, they could go into something like that as well. Or if this one didn't have it, you could put a 10 gig interface card in there because times four is required for that. Now let's jump over to the memory. The memory, there are four slots provided. Now they are uh, capable of, a, of 48 gig, gigabyte per slot DIMMs, which would give you a total, if you've got four of them, of 192 gigabyte. 48 gigabytes are rare. More likely you'd wind up with 32 gigabytes and go for 128, but you know, it is available to you if you wanted to do that. Just be aware that with DDR5, which is what this is, when you populate all four slots, you're not gonna get the highest speed capability of the memory. Usually it'll default to a baseline number for the motherboard, which I believe for this one, it's probably about 4,000 mega cycles of speed. So even if you put 7,000, which the board is technically capable of doing it, you probably would get nowhere near that, that speed. When you put it in XMP, that is. Along the top of the board, we have two EPS power connectors. There's an eight pin, and there's a four pin. The eight pin is required. You would have a little, there's a little light in here that'll come on that indicates that that one is empty and the board will not boot up. That's your indicator that this is loose or maybe it's a bad cable or something like that. The four pin is a supplemental to that to give you just a little extra power capability if you need it. Not likely, but I always plug that in if my power supply supports it and I have a cable for it. As you move along the top, you will then hit the pump connector. It's a PWM and it is used for either an AIO all-in-one or a custom pump for water cooling. The next one along here is the option fan, the second fan that supports the CPU fan, which is right next to it. So the CPU fan and the option fan. That's assuming you have two fans that are cooling your CPU, whether they're directly attached to an air cooler or they're connected to an AIO or something else. You have two of them there. They work in sync with each other. Then there's a special connector here called the CPU over voltage jumper. It's three pins. Right now it's in the position of not providing over voltage. But if you jumper this over, you pull that up and switch it over to the right hand two pins, you can then get over voltage capability through the BIOS. If, for example, some special case overclocking feature that you need to do that for. Over here, you have a standard four pin RGB, non-programmable, the Aura type RGB. There's only one of these on the motherboard. Then you have over here a three pin addressable RGB. Now there are two others of these at the bottom end of the board. So there's a total of three of these. Then we go into the 24 pin power, standard 
for most modern power supplies today. Now next to that, let's look at these two things together. There is a six pin additional power connector here. If you wanna use that, you plug one of the PCIe cables into that, at least six of the eight pins. So you separate it. Normally it has six and then two that are attached to it. You break it apart, put the six here. That will provide supplemental power to this USB-C connector that goes to the front panel. Hopefully you have a case that supports that. I highly recommend it. And if you have this power here, then it provides going from like, I think it's from 30 watts capable up to probably over 70 watts of capability in terms of that front panel for power purposes and thereby gives you fast charging of a device or connecting to a, a very large device that connects to a USB-C. In addition to this USB-C, this power provides additional power capability to the PCIe slots that we've already discussed. We have a standard USB 3.0 double header that's meant for like the front panel. It provides two ports in, in one cable and it gets split at the connection point. Then we have a total, and I'll say six of them are here and two of them are over here, a total of eight SATA connectors. These are the data connectors. Now you'll find out when I talk about the M2 drives that this thing provides. If you use the fourth M2 slot, it will disable four of these SATA data connectors. I believe it disables these two and these two over here basically numbers five through eight, because it shares the same data path to the CPU as those SATA ports, the M2 that is. Then over here, we have the standard front panel connector. It supports all the standard front panel connectors, and we do have a Q connector that you can put into this and make it easier to populate it as you're building the PC. I do recommend using that. It also has a, a, a case intrusion detection, which only certain cases support. So, you know, you, if you happen to have that and you want to use it, this will support it. Then we have two more PWM fans over here, case fans. And then we have two separate dual USB 2.0 connectors. They can be either connected to a front panel or to a supplemental device, or usually some sort of additional controller like for RGB and fan control that the case or your fans come with. Then over here we have two more, as I mentioned, two more addressable RGB 3-pin 5-volt connectors that are over here, there are two more fan connectors, and then a COM port. Most people don't use that, but you can buy a COM port connector and then have it accessible, let's say, from one of the spare I.O. slots that are at the back of the case. Used very rarely, but if you have special devices, for example, uh, scientific type devices that you need to get to from your PC and COM port is the only thing supported, you do have that capability. And then you have over here the front panel audio. So if you have front panel audio, that will be supplied by this. Very rarely used, but one thing special about this board, it actually supplies additional capability to the front panel than it does to the back panel. But I'll leave, you, I'll leave that up for you to take a look at. Now let's talk about the uh, M2 drives, the NVMe M2. There are a total of four in here. So there's one here, that's considered number one. There's another one here, number two number three and number four. And as I said, number four shares data paths with four of the SATA. If you take a look at this, you will see some interesting aspects to it. Let me take this off. First of all, the, scree the screws are actually captured screws, which makes it real handy. So you don't have to worry about losing them or getting them uh, in with some special tools, which sometimes you have to do. And as you can see, there are two of them there. There's one over here and one over here. The actual sockets are reversed of each other. But one thing that's interesting here, if you look at these little method for securing the M2, it doesn't use the screw to, like traditional motherboards have been doing for many years. It instead has this little thing you just turn with your finger and you can lock the M2 into place. Makes it real easy not to deal with that little screw that can sometimes cause some issues. Also, you see the pad here. And the motherboard does come with three or four of the extension pads, which you put on top of this rubber pad to make it a little bit taller when you have an M2 that does not have um, ICs on the bottom side, which are most of them that you could get today. They don't have the actual bottom side chips. If you do, then you don't add that thing. But if you don't, you should add that little thing to, to keep it more level as it, and a resting point for it when the M2 is sitting there. That way you get better contact with the thermal pad as well by having it pushed up just enough to touch the thermal pads. And uh, that pretty much 
demonstrates what you have access to and what you can change and what you can utilize separately. There are two more case fan headers over here and uh, I think that's about it. So let me, uh, let me go ahead now and show you what came in the box, okay? Okay, here's what came in the box. First off, the wireless antenna, the Wi-Fi. This is an interesting one because it actually has an embedded magnet in the base here. So it will stick on to a case, top, bottom, back, you know, wherever you have access to a case panel that's made of steel. This will connect to it. So that's a nifty little thing. Then we have the Q connector that I showed before. It allows you to pre-plug in all of the connectors for the various front panel and other connectors that you may have, including if you want to add a speaker, which I always do, it can support that as well. And you just plug them all in as one into the connector on the front panel part of the motherboard. Then you have, looks like three of these little rubber jumpers that extend the rubber connector. It's a three or four. This one might have two in it too. So it might be four of them that you actually have in here. So you can extend any of the four rubber standoffs that are for the M2s. You can make them taller if you happen to not have the chips on the bottom side. And here is that little rubber stopper that I talked about for the hole that's up in the IO shield toward the top of the motherboard. Then you have two more spare of these little twist connectors that allow you to lock the M2 drives into place. So, you know, in case one breaks on you or you want to, it wears out or whatever, you have two extras in here. Then you have what looks like four SATA data cables. Two of them are right angle at one end and the other two look like they're straight through. That's what I see here in this little package, okay? Two straight through, two right angle. And then they give you a little trinket that represents the, uh, the ProArt Creator motherboard. It's a little ruler. It looks like it has about uh, 12 centimeters, just, uh, just under five inches. And it has a little hole in it so you can put it on a keychain or you can put it onto your bulletin board, you know, whatever it is that you want to do in terms of showing that you, you have that motherboard. Okay. And that's it. That's what came with it. In terms of pieces, it also has the user manual, which is pretty good. I still like to use the ones online available, you know, through the ASUS website because I like the larger print and I can easily capture pieces of it, which I probably have shown some throughout this video. And then you have, you actually get a, what is it, a three month free for the ASUS Control Center. It allows you to get, uh, I think it's uh, Adobe products, the licensing for three more months. You can extend the one you have, or you can, you know, go ahead and try it out. So that's in there. And then it has a couple of safety brochures with it too. And of course, as I showed before, this little cable, this uh, DP cable, about two feet, just under, if you, have, you want to use the Thunderbolt to go to a high-end 8K monitor, okay? Okay, let me give you some general insulation notes and suggestions that I've determined after fully studying this particular motherboard. I would always use a minimum of 1000 watt power supply, preferably 1200 watts. Now I know that the manual talks about 850, but I think if you have both a 12th or above gen Intel CPU and a rather high end, let's say a 4000 series graphics card, you're gonna need more than that. I would say, unless you don't have an additional PSU PCI power connector available, always connect the PD under 12 volt under power. This is the extra connector that I showed you on the board that allows for an extra six pins for a PCI cable to pump up both the charging capacity of the USB-C from 27 to looks like 60 watts, and also the actual PCIe slots to have more capability in terms of power generation for those as well. So please do that. I would connect both the eight and four pin CPU EPS power connectors. I think I did mention that. That way you have a little extra in reserve just in case the cable, you know, is used so the power supply may not be up to par. 
When installing NVMe M.2 storage, start at the closest slots to the CPU. That is actually identified as M.2 under 1. If you install in the bottom most slot, M.2 under 4, since using that socket will disable the four SATA connectors, I would hesitate doing that. If only the top of your M.2 chip is on it, if the chips exist only in the top part of the M.2 that is, make sure to add the additional rubber spacer. I think I did mention that. The ARGB and Aura RGB headers only support three amps of power draw. Now that represents more power with the Aura RGB since that's 12 volts, but still, you wanna make sure you check the fans and find out how much their power draw is. Generally, it's about a half an amp each fan, but double check with the specs on your fans. ARGP headers also can only support up to 500 addressable LEDs. So don't put so many devices on there with a lot of LEDs that it would not be addressable. That would lead to confusion with the ARGB software when you try to configure it. Power off the motherboard before adding or removing any RGB or ARGB connectors. Really, that's important and a lot of people don't do that. I recommend that you purchase and add speakers to the front panel connector, purchased separately, to provide audible boot notifications. I like to hear that single beep when the thing boops up. That tells me that the thing will probably run. So make sure you add it, it doesn't cost much, it costs a couple of dollars and you can put that little speaker on there, right there on the motherboard. Save the CPU socket cover in case you need to remove the CPU and return it to the motherboard. A lot of people forget to do that. So those are some of my general recommendations that I have. Okay, here is your uh, Asus ProArt Z790 Creator Motherboard. Let's say you want to use both of those interfaces, the 10 gig and the 2.5. Well, if you go ahead and have a switch in your local area network, or you know, it could just be your router with switch ports on it, you can connect your motherboard, and I would connect the 2.5 gig directly over to the switch. Now you're on your local area network without any issue. But let's say you also have a separate NAS in your network. And this NAS is a high performance one, has a couple of 10 gig ports on it already. One of the things you can do is now, let's connect the 10 gig interface from your Asus motherboard directly to that NAS. That'll give you high speed performance directly to the data that you need to be continually dealing with. And that will increase your productivity tremendously. Of course, what I do recommend is also connecting the NAS up since it has multiple interfaces in most cases directly to your local area network, but I would go directly to one of the 10 gig interface ports on your switch if you have such a thing. Now you have the best of both worlds and now your ProArt motherboard is connected directly to the high speed storage external and to your local area network and everything will work fantastic. Anyway, that's my suggestion. And that's it. So I'm going to Thank everybody for watching the video and uh, you'll be seeing this going into my next PC build and we'll see exactly how it functions, how it performs and how some of the options here that, you know, really inspired me to buy it, how they work. Okay. Till the next time. Take care.